in 2016, my dream came true and I went to my first ever residency in the south of France and I flew and um, this is the shot from the plane over Nice. To get to our residency, you have to take a bus and it takes about two hours and um, this is the map for you to see uh, where Valoris is located. It's exactly between Antibes and Cannes. And um, this is our residency dwelling. Um, it is very old. Um, it's a former monastery uh, place and it's more than 500 years old and um, it uh, was the part of the reconstruction in the 1500 uh, in the town of Valoris. So on the first floor, there is a gallery. You could see um, the windows are closed right now. On the second floor, there is a kitchen where we would have our dinners um, and food and also our meeting place. Every Tuesday, we will meet there to discuss what's needed, materials, or any other questions. And on the third, fourth, and the fifth floor, this little window is my dwelling, just like in a fairy tale. <laughs> yeah. And this is the view from my window. And you could see the church, the chapel there, which was also the part of that monastery. And um, the streets, as you could see, are really narrow in uh, Valoris. And um, this street leads to our studio, which is only two minutes away. And um, you could see the back of um, the establisher of this residency, Dale Dorosh. He's an amazing person and um, it was great to work with him. He's an artist as well and I hope he is able to uh, watch this presentation. So uh, this is our door uh, where we would work and we had 24 access. Uh, each has a key and um, it was great to be immersed in the local activities as well. And um, every month there is a different group of artists at the residency and um, we became good friends and we still keep in touch. In fact, uh, Lauren, who is the second on the left, she uh, moved to San Rafael, which is only one hour from Valoris and uh, established her own place uh, of residency and workshops where I was um, scheduled to do my workshop in September. But everybody knows what happened to us in this world. And um, next to Lauren is Paivi, and she's from Finland. In the center, Gunilla, she's from Sweden. And Susan, who is next to me, is from the United States. And uh, we had a great time in the studio. So sometimes we we'll take break and uh, here's the moment where we're uh, sharing the headset with Lauren and having a little dance. And uh, by the way, for my Milongera friends, there are great Milongas in uh, uh, South of France. If you're dancing Argentine tango, when it's all over, we should go and um, visit them together. So sometimes I would work on the entrance of our studio, especially when uh, doing this grafito. This is the technique when you are scratching the surface and it's pretty dusty. And uh, this local dog, he loved to um, show up and um, see how it was coming together. So, and this dog belongs to this family. I really enjoyed how uh, local people are outside. They're enjoying their lives. Their kids are playing without being glued to the gadgets. 
all the time and um, adults are yelling across the street as if there is no phones at all. And um, here's another example of uh, old fashioned green way of uh, drying your laundry. Uh, and of course there is a big art community in Valores and um, these group of artists, they're just enjoying their white wine and coffee uh, instead of four o'clock tea. And uh, I would occasionally converse with them and it's a good way to practice your French because not so many people are speaking English over there. And um, we had the privilege to visit a local legend. His name is Gilbert Portanier. And um, he was at that moment 90 years old. Uh, he was born in 26. And I checked, um, he's still alive, I hope so, right. And uh, <laughs> uh, he moved to Valeris um, uh, he, he actually was born in Cannes, and then he studied in Par Par Paris and uh, as an architect, and uh, he was a painter. But then he met uh, Picasso in uh, 48, <clears throat> and then he moved to Valoris and uh, established his own workshop and studio uh, where he was uh, working with, their, with his friends and learning the ceramics on uh, his own. So um, for uh, Portanier, ceramics are the way to express him, his uh, emotions and feeling. He is um, extremely um, versatile in drawing and also he knows um, the glazes really well and um, he's a great um, colorist. And um, also in Valeris, uh, uh, there is a biennial of ceramic, contemporary ceramic arts. So every two years, there are great exhibitions where the whole city is uh, filled with amazing artists from all over the world. And um, this is one of the galleries um, during the biennial with the Korean artists. Valoris is known as the city of uh, 100 potters, and um, the pottery of uh, Valoris originated uh, from a traditionally culinary um, ceramics. It was probably born at the time of Roman um, occupation, thanks to the clay deposits there. And uh, from the 16th century, uh, that, uh, when the Italian families moved from Genoa to repopulate the city, they were also potters and um, um, the city was completely wiped out from the plague and uh, the tradition of, of pottery of, that we know of Valeris was born in the 17th century in the 19th century, the advent of a uh, railroad um, allowed the potters to uh, structure themselves and they started to work in the factories and they were all also able to ship their works via the sea. And um, in the 20th century, uh, unfortunately, the artisanal uh, pottery activity declined because of the industrialization. And uh, it wasn't until after the Second World War when Picasso brought um, new, he gave a new impetus to the pottery of Valeris and he also brought many artists uh, with him. And um, this is this bronze sculpture by Picasso that he gave to the city of Valoris. It's called L'Homme au Mouton, and uh, he gave it to the city in 1949. And uh, it stands right in the middle of the uh, little plaza, which is next to the Museum um, of Ceramic Arts and Museum of Picasso. 
And um, it also stands right in the middle of the market where we used to get our produce every day. As you know, in print, it's very nice and fresh. And uh, when uh, he is surrounded by the crates, which are filled with fresh food, he looks like this old pal who has always been there and who can be anywhere else. And um, this is the Chateau de Valoris, and it's a former uh, priority dating back to the 12th century. So our dwelling is the part of this priority. And uh, now it houses the, this, the Chateau, houses three museums, the Magnelli Museum, the Museum of Ceramic Art, and also the Picasso Museum. And it was as well reconstructed in the 16th century. In the yard of um, uh, this museum in the Chateau, there is this beautiful sculpture by Roger Capron. And um, he also moved to Valoris in uh, 1946. He was pretty young, uh, about 24. And um, he established um, his own workshop and uh, also bought an abandoned pottery which he transformed into the factory which grew later and um, I really love his colorful filled with vibrant spirit abstract sculptures with those linear forms and um, they're also all over Valoris here is another of his sculpture uh, next to us so this is Atelier Madura um, in uh, Valoris. Picasso met Suzanne and Georges Rami, who were uh, the owners of this place, and um, uh, he accepted their invitation to model a couple of uh, ceramic pieces. And then over a period of more than 20 years, he will execute um, different sources, say different things. But I, I think the, the, the believable one would be like more than 3,000 works. And um, he would return to Madura almost every day. And um, he made there a variety of plates and dishes and vases and sculptures, he was very attracted to the uh, versatility of clay, as well as to the magic of the firing processes. And mythology played an important part in the subject of Picasso ceramics, as he felt very connected to the spirit of the place that goes back way to the Etruscans and to the Iberians and to Greeks and to the Romans, and he was able to create his own universe, which is completely identifiable in terms of uh, anthropological or geographical identity. It was just his own Picasso ceramic universe. And um, initially, he wanted to create some works which would be affordable for people who could not, uh, couldn't afford his paintings. But then he learned the media and completely revolutionized it. So here's another piece in uh, Madura, in the, the gallery of Madura, because now it's a gallery. And uh, one of his owls, which he used as graffito technique, where you cover uh, the, darker clay with some lighter slips and then you scratch away the surface to reveal the lower layer of contrasting color. And then I'm going to my studio, to our studio, because I'm all inspired to create my own interpretation of this joie de vivre or joy of life um, concept there. So this bust of a lady it's called After the Swim. She's just enjoying her 
ice cream and her hair turned into an octopus tentacles and she has uh, a French shirt, uh, which I graffitoed as well. And I've done some other um, wool pieces, which are also graffito. This is Europa. And uh, you see the bull with the third eye here. And um, I also produced a series of the pieces, which I called Sweet Dreams of Valoris. So these are two dimensional, uh, I mean, they're like uh, uh, pillows in the shape of a pillow's wall pieces, which I use lots of sgraffito. And um, I also experimented with porcelain. Um, it's um, mm -hmm. an amazing material which gives this uh, luminous quality. It's not really easy to work with, but it's it's very pretty. And uh, uh, this is one of the works it, uh, she called Angela. And uh, she's just uh, being sculpted, not fired, um, just drying there. And I also experimented with the paper clay. It's extremely hard to work with. And uh, uh, my friend Susan had lots of fun with it, and uh, she was very successful. I've done a couple of pieces, and uh, I uh, didn't do much. Uh, mm -hmm. These are works um, from the first firing. After the first firing, you could see how white the porcelain is. And here they are after the second firing where I uh, also incorporated some of the clear glaze and um, blue um, oxide. Uh, so it gives a nice blue background to it. And um, after about a week of hard work, but morning swims, uh, we decided to start exploring uh, around the area and the first place we go, the place, it's a town called Antibes. And uh, it always has been an important trading point which was founded by the Greeks in the fifth century BC. Then it was conquered by Romans in the second century BC. And then after the collapse of Roman Empire, uh, Antibes suffered the centuries of unrest and consistent invasions from different barbarians. And it wasn't until the 15th century when Antibes came under the French rule and then settled the, the town. So right now it's a very popular international destination. So the first place we go in Antibes, guess what? Picasso Museum. So uh, originally it was um, a place um, where the residency of bishops from uh, 442 until 1385. And then it belonged to Grimaldi family and thus it's called Grimaldi Castle. And then it was um, obtained by the city of Antibes in 25. In 46, Picasso stayed there for a couple of months and he produced 23 paintings and 44 sketches, very productive. And then he uh, gifted his um, paintings and sketches to the city of Antibes and later added the 78 ceramics that he produced in Madura. And in six, 1966, the first ever uh, museum of Picasso was opened. So um, I want to show you one of his very famous pieces, which is called Joie de Vivre. Um, in, uh, during the war, Picasso spent lots of, um, I mean, he spent um, time in Paris because it was occupied it and by the Nazis, so he couldn't leave. And then as soon as the war ended, he left immediately to South of France. And um, 
during the uh, his uh, 40s and 50s it was a great period of happiness and um, here you see um, in the center the uh, his muse his uh, lover Francois Gillot who was also an artist and um, they had two children together they had very nice and joyful time so he depicts this moment when she's playing tambourines and um, um, there are uh, satires and those uh, uh, funny uh, beasts who are dancing and they're also playing the double barrel flutes which are quite typical in the south of France and um, this painting is also uh, an homage to the uh, joy of life done by painted by Matisse in uh, 1906. So this is the view from the other side of the museum. You can imagine how one could be very inspired by looking at the sea every day and uh, painting and um, here's another sculpture not by uh, Picasso but by uh, Spanish artist um, Jome Plenza and it sits at top of a restored waterfront fort and um, it is also a historical place in uh, uh, it was originally uh, a temple there built by Romans and uh, it was a place of worship and they dedicated to the septum Severus. and a few centuries later Christians uh, built the church over the ruins of the this temple and it was called um, dedicated to Saint James and then the church was destroyed and uh, the replaced with the bastion saint Jean, and uh, um, then it was transformed into a shipyard which was covered with the roof and where this is where the sculpture is sits and um, it's constructed out of uh, welded letters and uh, he is creating this uh, the poetry or the thought which is created out of uh, like we are creating the, the buildings out of bricks, so the same the sculpture is created out of letters. And another great thing to do in Antibes is to take this amazing hike. It's called Cap d'Antibes, and uh, it takes about two hours, and behind those pine trees, there are amazing uh, villas which are concealed and we're, when you're walking throughout those olive trees and pine trees along the side of limestone cliffs uh, and rocky caves, it takes you far away from the hustle and bustle of um, French re resorts, Riviera resorts, and uh, it's just a few kilometers away. And uh, this is the end of the hike. I wouldn't say it's an easy hike, but it's totally worth it because it's very spectacular. Another place in Antibes is a public beach. And here I caught the moment when my friend Susan contemplates the sea. And when they came back to the mm -hmm. studio, I made uh, this piece. It's called The Waiting, and um, as if this character is waiting for this ship to take her away somewhere, nice place. <laughs> and uh, another destination is Nice. Uh, so it's the train station of Nice, which was built in the 17th century and uh, it's very beautiful uh, on the outside and inside and um, Nice is the seventh most populous destination in France 
and it's also called uh, Nice La Belle, which means the Nice, nice is beautiful, and um, it is also very old. It was uh, established by the Greeks of uh, Marseille in uh, 350 BC, and uh, they called it Nikaia after Nike, uh, the goddess of victory, as you know. And uh, through the ages, it belonged to many different hands from Savoy to Kingdom of Sardinia, and then back to France in 1860. And in the second half of the 18th century, English aristocracy started to escape their harsh winters, spending time in uh, Nice. And then also uh, in the 20th century, we know uh, famous people like um, Scott Fitzgerald and the uh, Murphy family spent time there and um, they established their own cultures. And uh, um, the clear air and soft light also appealed to notable painters such as uh, Marc Chagall and Picasso and uh, Henri Matisse and uh, Paul Cezanne, Fernand Leger, just to name a few. And here's another view to uh, Nice. And then the first place we go in Nice is the Museum of uh, Marc Chagall. And uh, it's a national museum that was created by the artist Will to bring together 17 of his most important biblical paintings. And uh, it was incredible to see so many of his large paintings being brought together. Marc Chagall had an incredibly eventful life. He lived up until 98. He was born in Vitebsk, Belarusia, and then he lived through Russian Revolution, he left Moscow in 1922, uh, to, went to France, then he had to escape Nazis during the Second World War, and then he lived in the United States, then he lived in Palestine, then back in France, in the town called Saint Paul du Vence, which I'm going to show you as well. And uh, he was a painter and a printmaker and a theater designer. He made mosaics and also uh, stained glass windows. And the collection of the works at this museum, the biggest one, and it, uh, there are over 400 paintings, drawings, and pastels done by Marc Chagall. And uh, how convenient it is so, to have a Matisse museum in the same city. So he was, as you know, another titan of uh, modern art and uh, also one of those uh, multidisciplinary artists who explored the variety of medium, and he's primarily known as a painter, but he was also uh, a sculptor, a printmaker, and a draftsman. And uh, Henry Matisse arrived in uh, Nice in 1917. Uh, he was escaping the First World War, and um, he never wanted to come back, so he lived there um, until, uh, I believe, 1954. And, um, he was in the avant-garde of a French Riviera of um, artist movement. And also he had long and prolific career and uh, never stopped working even when he forced to do his cutouts from the wheelchair. And um, his daily routine uh, consisted out of uh, three hours of painting in the morning, then canoeing, then playing his violin, then lunch, nap, then painting again until the sun comes down, then drawing, and he even worked on Sundays. 
So I think it's very inspiring for the other artists to have such amazing life and prolific. So here's some of his paintings. Next to the Matisse Museum, there are Roman ruins uh, on the a neighborhood called Simye. Uh, called, uh, so the Roman ruins are called uh, Cenimelum, and um, Simye was one of the Roman capital for this area for over 400 years from first until fourth century and it was conquered by Julius Caesar and uh, the Roman city is actually mostly beneath this upscale area but what is remaining is the amphitheater and the baths so the uh, it's the very similar to the size of Pompeii the city and amphitheater would hold up to 5,000 spectators. It had small army, it had um, a temple uh, dedicated to Mars, it had lots of shops and businesses, and a huge bath and spa complex, which was used as a social hub for uh, Roman life. And here we are in uh, the, these ruins. I just not, I couldn't help myself but to show you the beach of Nice and this, the quality of the air and the translucency. Uh, it, it's just amazing. I could imagine why so many artists and not artists and were attracted to this area and still are. And um, our next stop is Le Canet or Cannes. So Cannes uh, is known for its association which was rich and famous uh, since there is a Cannes Films Festival and also the international um, exhibition. So here I am underneath pointing um, to the exhibition, international exhibition <coughs> of the world. So, um, it is, Cannes also has a deep history and uh, in the second century BC, it was a fishing village and a port and it also went through many invasions and changed hands and it enjoyed uh, a period of calmness in the 18th century and the 19th century it flourished uh, because of the British aristocracy uh, and uh, it became the trendiest spot on the French Riviera. So one of my another of other famous um, and my favorite artist is Pierre Bonnard, and he stayed in this beautiful Belle Epoque house for over 20 years, and uh, may, many of his famous works were created there. And this is the uh, inside museum. And his works are built with bright colors that create poetic symbols based on his personal imagery. And he was a founding member of post-impressionist group of avant-garde painters. And uh, his early works were influenced by Paul Gauguin and uh, Japanese artist Hokusai, and he was also leading figure in the transition from the Impressionism to Modernism. So then we went to Grasse, and uh, it's uh, considered the world capital of perfume, and it had prosperous perfume industry since the end of the 18th century. And many noses are trained or come there to distinguish more than 2,000 cents. And the town is uh, just 12 miles inland from the shore. And um, I just want to share with you that jasmine, which is the key ingredient of uh, 
lots of perfumes, was um, brought to southern France by Moors in the 16th century. And now they're harvesting every year 27 tons of jasmine. And uh, there is uh, inside the, the, in the courtyard of the Museum of Perfume, uh, there is this petite train, little train, which can take you to uh, different little, very narrow streets of grass, which is very convenient for people with um, bad knees and ankles because it's very hilly there, but beautiful. And uh, we went to the Museum of Fragonard and um, it's located in a magnificent historical building of the late 17th century and displays over a dozen of his major works. And uh, Fragonard is uh, known for his uh, lyrical, occasionally cheeky, late Rococo paintings about love. This is his painting called uh, Swing. Uh, I am not a big fan of uh, his paintings, but I found something that I really enjoy. This is one of his uh, drawings that he has done with the brown ink and reminds me of uh, Japanese or Chinese scrolls. And uh, uh, it looks like he is more preoccupied here with the mood rather than with the subject. And the last town that we're going to visit in this presentation is Saint Paul du Vence. And it's the oldest med medieval town on the French Riviera, and it's the best preserved and one of the prettiest ones in um, Europe. And the walls that raise the village on its roots are from the mid 15th century and they have not changed since. And in the 19th century, the artists started to arrive uh, because they were very attracted by the light and the architecture. And uh, uh, this is one of the views from the inside. The town has lots of galleries and shops which you could go through. There is like a maze and um, there are hidden treasures such as this. This mural is by Fernand Leger and um, uh, it's in a restaurant called La Colombe d'Or and it's also like a complex of a restaurant and hotel and it was established in the 1920s. And uh, this place attracted many artists who often paid their bills with their art. And how convenient for the owners of this establishment, they were able to amass a priceless co collection of the works of Picasso and Chagall and Calder, uh, uh, Matisse, and um, to name a few. And uh, meanwhile, our exposition is getting ready. And here's the poster uh, for our opening. And you could see the images of all of our works uh, there. And uh, here's my sculpture, uh, which is called um, Message from the Cloud. It greets the viewers from the window on the back, you could see those wall pieces. And this is my friend Veronique. She lives in Antiques and she also uh, an amazing artist who does uh, collages and sculptures and she's a printmaker. And uh, people, uh, local people are really nice and friendly and we had a great time at the opening. Um, so here, as you could see, this the piece, my um, bull is finished. And uh, this piece now belongs to the collection of the residency. And um, 
She is called Lady Octopus. I guess I'm obsessed with octopus who knows me. And uh, here's one of the close-ups of the pillows uh, with the fish. You could see how it's done. And here there are three of them together. And 12 pillows, sweet dreams of Valerie's together. So I also, uh, I made more actually, and uh, some of them I gifted, and, and some we exchange as artists. Uh, so now I have pieces from all of the artists with whom I worked, and from Dale as well. And uh, as I was experimenting with the porcelain pieces, so it was porcelain clay, and uh, these porcelain pieces, they were shown at the gallery next to our showing place. And this is the paper clay piece, which is called Blading Out. And here they are together. And this piece finished. I just used a little bit of clear glaze on her wings. And just to show um, the, the porcelain quality. And we had a really nice um, read, uh, article in a local newspaper. And this is the place which I miss the most. It's called Do uh, Golf Juan, where I would swim every morning. And it's famous for a couple of things. So it's famous for Napoleon uh, escaping uh, his exile in uh, Elba in 1815. And he landed on, in Golf Juan, went to Paris to be an emperor there for only 100 days. And also it is famous for this painting, which was done by Paul Signac in um, 1896. And it's just simply called Gold Juan. And this concludes my presentation. And I'm going to show you my work. Unless you want to ask me something in between. No, everybody's quiet. Okay. Actually, I, I have a comment, yeah. not so much a question, about Nice, because I went there a long, long time ago, a wonderful uh -huh. place, and I discovered there was, there's a Russian Orthodox cathedral in Nice. Yes. There must be an old connection with the Russian world yes. sometimes. That's Absolutely, because Ivan Bunin lived in Graz. Um, also, I, I forgot to mention, in Graz, uh, if you know this uh, famous writer, his name is Patrick Zuskin. And when I was a teenager, I read his book. It's called uh, Perfume. It is absolutely incredible. I totally recommend it. It gives you the, the idea how uh, the noses are working. And uh, it's, uh, it's like a, a detective, but it's so well written. And uh, in terms of Russians, I think there's also lots of uh, uh, Belarusians who escaped through Nice. There are also lots of contemporary Russians there that I've met. Uh, there is also a train uh, which is called, like it takes you from Moscow to Nice, exactly. They have like a separate line. So there is a big, culture of uh, French and Nice. They love it there. They absolutely love it there. So if you don't have any uh, comments or questions for now, I'm going to show you my work and you're welcome to ask me any questions during and then we'll have some sharing as well afterwards. I have a okay? question. I have a question. Yay. So um, I, I'm sorry I came into the, the conversation or your, your presentation a little late because I had a class I was teaching. But I wanted to know, how long in total were you there? And it must have been very hard for you to leave. It looks so inspirational, just the beaches alone. But all that artwork there, I would just be drooling all the time. So Absolutely. How long were yeah. you actually there working and able to 
to work on your art and then for your actual stuff. I have been there a month and uh, I also mentioned that there are amazing milongas. Lizette, <laughs> we should go together. I would love to. Uh, oh, take me, take me. <laughs> yeah. So I was, I was lucky. I befriended um, a local DJ uh, who is actually still DJing there. It's amazing. They, they don't have any social distancing. We should all go to friends. Wow. Uh, he just sent me a video, no masks, the, the usual tango. It looked like, uh, you know, last century. Anyway, so he took me to different milongas also in the north of Italy because it's very, very close. Oh, if yeah. you take the train, it takes you to Ventimiglia. It's the it's a town which is right on the border between the uh, Fr France and Italy, and there are amazing Italian milongas too there. All right. Great. So, how, how long did you actually spend daily on your craft? Oh, daily. So, um, at a, I would work in the morning. No, I would swim in the morning. Then I go to my studio. I mean, to our studio. Then I would uh, have lunch break, then go back to the studio. Then, you know, sometimes I work there after midnight because we had a, uh, access 24 hours nice. and you could hear. So the streets are really uh, narrow. You could hear the neighbors yelling across the windows. <laughs> you could hear so many things. Maybe you don't want to hear what you hear. It's like, <laughs> it's live. You're totally immersed in, in this. Um, uh, yeah, it was amazing because Valeris is not very uh, touristy. It's not like Nice or Cannes or Antibes. Uh, it's it's, uh, it's in, slightly inland because to get to the sea, you have to go down. So you could take a bus, which is really, I mean, it's only 10 minutes, but it's on the hill, or you could walk. It's 45 minutes to walk, nice. all right? Nice. So you guys want to see what they have, have, have been cooking in yeah. my studio? Yeah. Yay, all right. Let me switch the cameras and uh, I'll show you. So it hasn't been fired yet. It, it's one of my latest pieces. Uh, the working title is How Much Can You Take? So it has the uh, little pockets here, which I'm going to fill with glass, melted glass like this. I've made some tests, which are really, really pretty. Mm. Wow. Yeah, and the, this this is one of my shell dwellers. I just recently decided to come back to the shell dwellers because we're all back into our shells, right? <laughs> and um, she she holds the the pearl of wisdom here, and I'm just going to turn her to for you to see. And um, I'm going to make this one a little bit larger for you to see. So it's her sister. And she has huge lashes. And uh, when she bats her lashes, the wind comes in. <laughs> it also has pockets. So this piece uh, I showed you last time and it wasn't fired yet. And this is virtual reality with glass body. This is called Solace. So delicate, those hands. Yes. You, see, you really do um, the hands so incredibly well. Whenever I look at your pieces that have hands, I'm always mesmerized by them. Thank you. Really well done. Okay, so, and then next to 
This is my ice cream. Because we all need the pleasures of life, right? <laughs> ice cream runner. She has a glass skirt. And next to her is the piece which I call There is no insomnia in the cloud. This piece. So uh, it's called What is Happening? <laughs> and it's it's done during the um, protests. But it has an eye on the back and um, it predicts a hopeful future for us. Can you, I bring, hope. can you bring the camera closer to the, the front part on the other side? I wanted to see your the details of the face. This this one? Uh, to, to this the, one? To the other side. To the other side? For sure. Absolutely. Oh, look at that. That's so nice. Cool. Okay. I had another question about your clay pieces. You had um, where there was the darker clay and mm -hmm. then uh, whiter clay was put over it. Are those literally the colors of the natural clay or are they dyed with an element added to them? Or I'm, I'm just a little curious about that. So the this black Spanish clay, which looks really, really brown, right? It has lots of manganese in it. So this is why it has this uh, very deep chocolate color. Uh, really pleasant to work with, but if you wanna, like, if, if you're, it's, it's easy to mix them in your studio, so you have to keep the area of white separate from the darker clays. Sure. Um, so it, I didn't add anything except I uh, applied a little bit after the second firing. I applied a little bit of um, cobalt oxide to give this nice blue um, background to remind us that this is the, the sea area and any moment you could see it or you could be immersed in it. Um, but the porcelain is pure white. This Black is very dark clay. Oh my God, I, I loved it. I even brought with me. So Kate, you have a sculpture from there. My, um, the steam rising under the new moon. Yeah. Oh, I exactly. love that. Yeah. So she, the clay is brought from that place, but it turns out it's an Irish clay. Sorry. I know, you oh. told me that. Yeah. <laughs> That piece also has really exquisite, fine, delicate fingers. And mm. I have it on um, a tray that turns also, so that um, every time I go over there, I have several of your pieces, I turn them, because there's not one side that doesn't have something to gaze on for a while. So mm. that piece is really- She has different side, uh, phases of the moon, right? Yes. There is, there is a moon, moon, moon. So <laughs> the steam takes shape under full moon only. You have to observe that. I will. Cool. Yes. So happy to hear that. Natasha, I absolutely loved that tour. Oh, thank you so much. Thank it you. It was fantastic. I love Nice, but St. Paul de Vence is my oh. favorite place in the world and i just thank you so much it was just such a fantastic tour and i love your work thank you so much could you introduce yourself because we can't see your name oh carol i'm carol boyd oh carol yeah my new collector yay That's right <laughs> lovely meeting you the chocolate ones the chocolate you the chocolate ones yeah, maybe it will inspire me to create chocolate sculptures and it will be very zen. You make a sculpture and you give it to somebody, then you just eat it and that's it. 